Hello everyone, welcome to this video about a controversial subject. And what happened was, uh, this week I was <coughs> visited by Maestro Dennis Cheng from Canada and uh, we worked together on some projects and we spent a lot of time talking about various subjects in music and we, we are great friends but we like um, debating subjects and uh, seeing if we have different opinions and we have different opinions on lots of things and one of those things is ear training and uh, he is already a big proponent of ear training and I am a big anti-proponent of ear training. Now I'm gonna explain it better, I'm gonna be uh, more careful with uh, the way I express that but then in the end we, de we concluded that there's lots of things we actually agree on and there's lots of things that he calls ear training that I don't call ear training. So um, I decided to make a list of things that I think are way more useful than ear training when it comes to learning how to play jazz guitar or how to improvise jazz on a guitar. Coming right up after this bumper. Now I fully realize that this might be a touchy subject. So before I dive into my top 10 or my 10 activities list, I just want to say that this is just my opinion. Um, and it's just one guy's opinion. It might be very far from the truth. I'm just telling you things from my perspective as someone that learned how to play jazz guitar in a relatively short time, right? And Maybe you hate it. If you hate my playing, and that's why I played a longer time in the beginning, if you hate my playing, you really shouldn't listen to anything I have to say because my opinion is worthless because you don't like the way I sound. So obviously my methods lead to that kind of result. So don't listen to me. Now, if you do like it, you might want to hear me out and see if my opinions hold any merit. Let's, let's call it like that. Now, first I want to... Um, give my definition of ear training because when I was discussing this with Dennis um, <laughs> when I, I said to him, uh, I, to him like you know I think it's much more important to work on this specific thing then he would say well that is ear training for me and, and I said well but then maybe we should work on this thing this other thing and he said well that's also ear training for me so there's uh, lots of different definitions of ear training uh, but what I consider to be ear training is interval recognition chord recognition, uh, chord progression recognition, uh, melodic, um, uh, melodic, uh, what do you call that in English? When somebody um, says something to you, you have to write it down. I don't know what the words in English, but if somebody plays something on the piano and you would have to write it down, right? That kind of uh, ear training, that is what I call ear training. It's very academic ear training, what you would get on a conservatory or university where you sit in a classroom and the teacher plays the chord on the piano and then you have to say, oh, this is minor major seven nine or something, right? Or he plays a reference note and then plays interval and you say, oh, that's um, a tritone, right? Stuff like that. That's what I call ear training. Now I think, in my opinion, that is a complete waste of time. If, you, if your goal is to play jazz on a guitar, that is a simple, um, that is what I mean by it, right? I don't mean like if you want to be able to recognize chords, of course, then ear training is very useful. But I'm just looking at, at it from my perspective and from the perspective of my channel. And my channel is all about how to learn how to play jazz guitar or gypsy jazz guitar. Uh, for that purpose, I think ear training is a complete waste of time. Um, I never really did it. Or uh, and, uh, when I teach at, at my university, I never require my students to do it. I never ask them any questions about it. It goes as far um, as this, that when I'm in a rehearsal and someone, there's this kind of culture of a uh, band leader to play chords on the piano or something when, when they want different chords and say, well, let's play, guys, let's play these chords. And then everybody sh should magically be able to hear it. I would be the first one to say, sorry, I don't hear shit. I just tell me the chord names, even though I might have heard it. I just don't like this kind of pressure put on musicians because most musicians can play really well, or good musicians, when you just say to them, it's F7 to B flat, right? And then the whole kind of uh, 
landscape of possibilities opens up for them on their instrument because they have studied what to play on F7 to B flat. So I, to make it a positive video, I compiled a list of 10 activities that I think are way more useful than ear training. But you already know that I think ear training wouldn't even make a top 100, 100. Okay, so let's start with number 10. Now the first five, they are more about inspiration and the, the top five are more practical and I will maybe demonstrate some stuff. But I think being inspired while practicing jazz improvisation is very important because I do realize that practicing jazz improvisation can be very frustrating. And I think the best tool to fight frustration is being inspired or inspiration. So on number 10, and I will put the text here, number 10 is visiting concerts. And this might seem like a, a something a logical step, but there's many musicians that actually don't visit concerts, right? They don't have time for it or too much money or, I don't know. I find visiting concerts of my heroes or maybe even someone I don't know but was recommended to me is very inspiring. For example, uh, two weeks ago, three weeks ago now, I went to see Peter Bernstein. It's the fifth time I went to see him and it was a great, great concert. And I leave such a concert fully inspired to work even harder because when I see him play, I realize, okay, this is the, this is, there's, there's so many things he is doing that I should be doing that I'm not doing. I should work on that starting now, right? And I think that kind of inspiration can only come from visiting a concert and seeing a musician play live and interacting with the musicians around them. Now, number nine is a, it's a substitute. I, I want to say a poor substitute, but it isn't because it's also important. And that's actually listening to music. And with listening to music, I mean active listening, right? It means you sit down and you listen to a great artist perform or play or improvise. And you're listening for specific things, right? You're listening uh, for his tone, uh, for licks that you might like, right? Because I, oftentimes when I put on a rec recording, I want to listen to specific vocabulary that person might use that I can maybe write down, transcribe, learn myself. Or I want to listen to how his swing eighth notes correlate to the the quarter notes of the of the right symbol or of the quarter note of the rhythm guitar. I listen for very spe specific stuff. I call it active listening, as opposed to just putting on a recording and relaxing and, and, and enjoying the music, which is also very good. But for this list, I'm, I'm looking for things that are very inspiring. And I think active listening is very inspiring because when I listen like that, I immediately want to go to my instrument and start practicing. Okay, I'm going to go quickly. Number eight is composing songs. And I might say, oh, composing songs, that, that seems like a high level thing to do, but um, it shouldn't have to be. And the way I propose you can do it, you will see that it's pretty easy to do when you actually try it. And that way is to take a song that you already like, let's say like um, Autumn Leaves, right? And you just compose another melody on top of the chords. And you can do this all by ear, right? You could sit at the piano, you could play the chords and just sing something you like and then find the notes and write them down. And I wrote many songs like that and I perform them and people love them, right? For example, to give an example, like the tune Coquette, which I really like to play. Oh, that's the song one, two, three, four. Ta -dum, ta -da -dum, ta -dum. I often, often play it in my channel. I, I wrote a theme on that, goes like this. One, two, one, two, three, four. comes and I wrote the bridge. It's a fun little theme. It's completely different from the original and there's some um, some stops in it in the in the theme right that I, I can rehearse with a band and it's fun and then when we start improvising it is just a chords of coquette and everybody knows that tune in gypsy jazz so it's, it's easy to play. I wrote that tune in maybe 10 minutes. I already had, had the chords. I came up with a little like 
groovy little riff. Daily do da ba ba. And then I came up with some hits for the band, right? Daily do da da da. Everybody does that. And then there's a break. Ba da ba do. Daily do da. Stuff like that. It's fun to do. I, I think I wrote like 30 of those tunes. And they're all completely different from the original, but um, it's still based on a harmonic progression that I didn't have to come up with. Now, of course, I wrote, I wrote many tunes with harmonic progressions that I came up with, but that's more difficult. Uh, so on this list, I just mean you take a chord progression of a tune you like, you love, and you come up with a little, uh, with another melody, maybe with a little arrangement behind it. You can probably do that within an hour. Okay, number um, seven, obvious thing, is learning songs, right? Um, I should maybe say number seven of activities more useful than ear training is learning songs. And with learning songs, I mean that you, there's a couple of uh, things you could do, with, uh, roads you could take. But I basically mean that you add another song to your vocab, uh, to your repertoire list, right? I have a list with all the songs I know, and I just want to add another one. And there are several ways you can go about it. One way would be to find a recording that you like and try to find the chords from the recording. But that is a difficult thing to do. I mean, you could learn it. Uh, by the way, you could, do, you could learn this without ear training. Uh, maybe I'll make a video about it. But if you can't do it or it takes too long, what you could do, what I like to do is I have my iReal app and all, all the songs are in there and I could learn it from that chart, the chords, and then I would find someone who already knows the song. You could, could even do this through Skype and you could show them the chords, that person the chords and say, do you, are these the right chords? And then they would maybe say, yeah, those are the right chords, but in, in, bar, in the bridge there, I like E7. And then you make, you copy the chart and you write his name or his or her name with the chart and you and you make the change in the iReal app. And so in that way you can collect many different versions of a song with interesting chord progressions, which you can easily learn from the app. Of course, then you gotta learn the theme and you can find a lead sheet or you can again find a recording and just go note by note until you got the theme in your fingers. It's a fun activity, it's important and, and way more useful than ear training. Okay, number Got a list here, number six. Now this is not number six, but this could have been even number one, but because it's not really very, it's not it's not really an active um, activity. Um, it's more of a passive thing. I, I put it on number six, but it's very important. It is recording yourself. Basically means you put a, preferably a camera, so like your phone, and you just record yourself playing uh, maybe to a backing track and the reason to do that is to watch it back and be very critical of what you're doing. And I mean critical about every little thing, about your tone, about your timing, about your choice of licks, about, I mean, the way you look, right? Uh, the way your hands move. And it is the best tool to correct yourself, I think. Uh, there's nothing like watching a video of yourself and hear yourself play as a third person and just be very critical of, of your faults and also be appreciative of what you're doing correctly. But um, this could have been number one because I think every musician should do this at every stage in their development. But I put it on number six because it doesn't require, require a lot of effort, right? Just putting your phone there and film yourself and then make notes about what you don't like and work on, on, those, um, on those things. Number five, and now we get to the things that I find very, very important. Okay, number five activity, way more useful than ear training, is jamming with other musicians. And I'm talking about hardcore jamming here. I'm not talking about like uh, being in a guitar store and playing a song with a friend. I'm, talk I'm talking about going to a, a festival, especially when you play gypsy jazz, you could, there's many festivals you could visit. You could visit the festival in Fontainebleau in France in the summer and jam, at that festival for, for six hours a day, six to 10 hours a day. Just go through every song you know, play with everyone that you meet there and just try the best you can and listen to other people jam and be inspired by the jamming. Maybe uh, trading licks, change, exchanging licks, um, learning new songs during the jam, especially when you start jamming with people that are slightly better than you or, or much better than you. 
Now, if you can't visit a festival, of course, you could invite people to your home or visit other people to jam, but make sure it's a it's a hardcore jam, right? You're not there to to uh, drink to drink a beer and and watch the football game and then also play a song. No, you're there to jam. You're jam. You're there to jam for two or three hours, going through your complete uh, repertoire list of songs and and uh, trying trying all the new stuff that you studied and, and, and asking maybe for the opinions of the other musicians in the jam that are much better than you. That's what I mean with jamming, hardcore jamming. Okay, number four, and now you might be surprised because this is one of the things I said to Dennis that's way more useful than ear training, but then he would say, no, but that is ear training. But I don't consider it ear training and I will explain. And number four is transcribing, very important. Transcribing or finding transcriptions. Now, to find transcriptions, you don't need to have, uh, you don't need to do any ear training at all, right? You don't need to transcribe yourself, so you just find transcriptions. It is important though that you find good transcriptions of uh, things you wanna learn. Uh, one such resource, of course, is my uh, Patreon um, site, my Patreon page, and there's like hundreds of pages of, of transcribed lines. But there's, there's definitely many other resources. There are books, um, there are other people that sell transcriptions, as long as you know that the source is good, that the person that made the transcriptions did a good job. Now, if you want to transcribe yourself, you don't need good ears. What you need is software that slows the music down, like SoundSlice, or that's free, or Transcribe, which is a pretty cheap program. And then you need a way to notate it, like a software, a Sibelius, Finale, uh, noteworthy, uh, there's also free programs, and you just go note by note, right? You just play the first note, you find the note on your guitar, and I don't care how you find it, you can play it until you have it, until you match the note, and you write it down, and then you write it down note by note, and you will notice that the more you do it, the faster it will go. So you could call it a form of ear training, but it has nothing to do with interval recognition or chord recognition, it's just writing note by note, until you have the, the complete lick of four bars. And then we, got, we get to number three. Number three activity, way more useful than ear training, wood shedding licks. Now this is something I do hours a day, right? I just take a lick that I transcribed or found in a transcription and I start practicing it like crazy with a backing track. And I don't wanna go into the details because I made several videos about the subject. I will link one in the description. Uh, I think it's called practice regimen. So look for the video called practice regimen in the description and there I show you the process um, of practicing and then I made another one where I'm practicing live in front of the camera. I will also link that. Watch those videos to mean what I, to see what I mean by wood shedding licks. Number two, activity way more useful than ear training and this is way, way, way more useful than ear training is practicing your timing because the most important thing about the music or about the notes that you play is the timing of the notes. And with that I mean um, that specifically for jazz guitar, I mean that your swing eighth notes are consistent and are aligned to the quarter note of the rhythm section. And I can go into a lot of detail, but I will link a video in which I demonstrate this and I talk about it in detail and give you exercises and I have a slide with uh, some points to think of. But the thing I want to get across is that the timing is the leading factor in if you are considered to be a good improviser. It's not the notes that you play. That comes after it, of course. Let's say we have two musicians and they both have great timing and one is very harmonically sophisticated, then people might say, well, he's a better soloist. Well, not necessarily though, they might not, not like it. But if your timing is bad, it doesn't really mean that, uh, it doesn't mean, uh, if your timing is bad, playing very complicated stuff won't mean anything, right? It only means something once your timing is good. Now, unfortunately, training timing or getting good timing is one of the most difficult things in music. And everybody struggles with that. I struggle with that too, right? There's days that I have better timing. There's times I, I have better timing in the videos than other videos. And I can feel that and I work on it continuously. 
and it's always improving, but I need to work on it continuously. And I think most musicians probably need to work on it continuously because timing is such a big subject. It's different in ballads, it's different in up-tempos, it's different in certain keys maybe because you're not used to the key, so then your timing starts to suffer, right? There's so much stuff that goes into having good timing that practicing timing is super important. And the way to do it, or the way I do it, and the way I think really works, there's a video about that on my channel, I will link it. Now, number one thing, way more useful than ear training, and maybe you can guess what it is, but the most important thing to activity to partake in when you want to learn how to play jazz or guitar is practicing technique. Because if you don't have good technique, it doesn't matter how good your timing is or how sophisticated your harmonic knowledge is, if you can't produce the notes on the instrument, what's the point, right? There's, I know lots of people that, um, that know every concept imaginable, harmonic concept imaginable, but because of their bad technique, they can't play any of it. So it, it doesn't mean anything. And those are usually also the people that say, you know, uh, like, oh, that, that guy, he, or gal is that he's too technical. He's too technical. It's too many notes, or you know, I don't care about technique. I care about soul stuff like that. You would probably only say if your technique is not very good, right? If your technique is good, you would never say that because you worked very hard on your technique. I don't know anyone who has good technique that didn't work really hard on it. And the way to work on te there's many ways on to work on technique, but the way I work on technique, I outlined in several videos. I will link one such video in the description, but. Whatever you do, work on technique every day, right? Technique and then timing and then the other activities, transcribing leaks, wood shedding. Now, as you can see, there's no ear training involved in any of these activities. So is there any way I can see ear training to be useful? The only way I can see it being useful is when you are in a situation, uh, when you have to perform, at a high level concert and you don't know any of the songs and you are expected to play great solos on stage um, without rehearsal, without maybe maybe you don't even know the set list. Maybe you go on stage and they just start and you have to play along. In that case, I would say yes. Uh, then having great ears is probably super handy but then you still need all the, the licks and the phrases and the timing. But that situation never arises. And that situation is very easy to avoid. Of course, you can look for it, but I avoid it, right? I mean, why would I want to subject myself to that kind of situation? I can just ask for the set list uh, a week before, three days before. And even if I have to perform the same day, which happened, I can still ask for the set list. Or I could just opt out of some of the songs I don't know. I don't have to... Um, I don't want to play in a situation where I cannot be, where I can't feel free. And that's usually what happens when people start playing songs that I have never heard before or are very strange without any logical chord progression. Now, of course, I've played so many uh, concerts and songs that usually when it's a song I don't know, I recognize the chord progression. But that just happened because I played so many songs. It's not because of ear training. Now, the last thing I want to say, and... I didn't start with this on purpose because that probably will aggravate a lot of people. But the main reason why I think ear training is absolutely unimportant or a waste of time when you want to play jazz guitar, right? I'm only talking about when you want to play, learn how to play jazz guitar, right? Notice the word jazz and the word guitar, right? I'm not saying anything about learning how to play jazz saxophone or um, that is a different field. I don't claim to be an expert. I claim to be an expert in jazz guitar. The main reason I say this is because I know personally know great players, really great world-class players that have very bad ears, that even would have trouble distinguishing between major and minor chords. But as soon as they know the chords, either by name or just uh, because they know what the chords look like on the neck, they play the greatest solos ever, right? So they obviously have bad ears, but are great soloists. 
because they trained all the things uh, that I talked about, like timing, uh, vocabulary, put uh, shedding licks. Um, they have great tone, right? Because they work on their technique. And they have great taste. And the great taste you develop by listening to lots of good music. Now, I also know the other way around. I know people that have amazing ears. You could um, play random notes on the piano and they would name every note that you're playing. You could play the most complicated chord progression and they would get it um, the first time. But when they actually have to play a jazz solo, it's kind of sucky, right? It doesn't swing. All the phrases they play are what I call, it's incoherent, right? Or it's random, or it's not really part of the style we're playing. Um, or it doesn't swing. Usually those people, they don't swing because they didn't never worked on timing. They, they probably worked on their ears or I don't know what they did. But when I start counting to four and, I, and we do rhythm changes, there's not a single good line coming out of the instrument. Then I just know, okay, this person didn't woodshed licks, didn't spend time working on technique, timing, or didn't listen a lot to music, active listening to music, didn't participate in active listening to music to get good taste. That is the main reason I am a, um, an anti-ear training extremist. <laughs> you know, people should do what they, um, they want, of course, but this is just from my perspective. And the same goes for studying music theory. Um, I think the two biggest uh, reasons for people not to practice or spend time with their instruments is ear training and, and, and learning mu music theory. When it comes, again, when it comes to learning jazz guitar, I think those two things are, uh, are completely useless. Now, if you disagree with me, and I can understand that you disagree with me because maybe I'm the first person to say it, then I invite you to comment on this video and we can have a discussion, but let's keep it civil because I, I mean no harm. It's all from my perspective and I, mean, I might be full of shit. Uh, again, if you don't like my playing, don't take my advice. If you like my playing, then you might maybe want to think about all of this and maybe I, you, can, you might change your opinion on, on this subject. If not, no problem. We can still be friends and I hope you still will watch my next video. Bye.